Welcome to the Multifamily Investor Nation podcast. I'm your host, Dan Hanford, and this podcast is sponsored by two great sponsors. We have our co-star sponsor, and then we also have RealPage IMS, and want to thank both of them. And if you're interested in an investor portal, IMS is a great portal. We've actually been migrating over to that, and then we also have been using the CoStar software for quite some time now as well, because it's a great benefit on the acquisition side of things. And with us today, this is going to be a special episode. With us today is the entire PassiveInvesting.com management team. So I have, of course, myself, Dan Hanford. We also have here, if you're watching the video, we got Danny, Danny Randazzo here. We also have Brandon Abbott. And so before we dive into this deal, so this is a 232 unit property that we're going to be talking about. It's a class A deal built in 2014. And so it's a, it's a really nice asset up in the, the Lake Norman area of the Charlotte MSA. The actual name of the property was Hawthorne at Lake Norman. And uh, we're going to be talking about some things that we're going to be, we're going to be doing with this property to kind of change things a little bit. But this particular acquisition was a, uh, a around, right about a $50 million acquisition. And we raised close to $20 million in the middle of the pandemic of the COVID-19 to be able to close this. And so uh, before we dive into that, though, I'd like for us to kind of, you know, go around and kind of give a little bit of an introduction and background. Most people on the, on the, on the web podcast have heard me probably too much. So I'll turn it over to you first, Danny. Have you discuss a little bit about you, yourself, and your background, and then have you turn it over to Brandon, and then I'll tee us off with some questions. Perfect. For those of you that don't know me, I am Danny Randazzo. I am based in Charleston, South Carolina, about an hour and a half or so from Columbia, where Dan and Brandon are. My uh, wife and I live here and our dog, George, we enjoy taking walks in the morning and in the evening. Right now, during the summer months, we try to beat the heat early and later at night. So that's one of our favorite activities. You'd probably find us walking and getting a coffee at some point during the morning hours. Um, a little bit about me, my background, I was in financial consulting for um, over half a decade doing financial work with multi-billion dollar corporations around the world and the United States to help them improve their business functions and financial performance at the end of the day. So teams of us consultants would be traveling a lot um, typically Monday through Thursday, and then, you know, working weekends and whatnot. So it was a very hectic lifestyle, great work experience. Um, just really hard to see myself raising a family and spending time with my wife when I was constantly on the road traveling. And so that's what really got me into multifamily investing and real estate first. So it was all about building passive streams of income, or really it was about building streams of income when I first got started because I was actively working or managing it. But I was trying to find that balance of not um, exchanging my time for money because I was spending so much time consulting and traveling. I needed to have alternative streams of income where I would earn money on a monthly basis without having to exchange my time. So super passionate about that. If anybody wants to know more about my story specifically, go to my website, dannyrandazzo.com. I've got all sorts of blogs and previous podcast interviews about how I got to where I'm at today and how our team even came together between Dan, Brandon, and myself to build this company in which we control 275 million in multifamily assets, over 2,200 doors today. So grateful to be here, happy to help the MFIN nation. And um, I'll turn it over to Brandon to take us away. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, as uh, Danny mentioned, I'm in Columbia, South Carolina, along with Dan. So we're right down the street from each other right now. Um, and uh, my background um, is in construction um, and insurance adjusting. So that's really the bulk of my knowledge base. Um, I live and breathe anything to do with construction. I, I know it inside and out. I, I can say that confidently. Um, I've done it all. And uh, even during the pandemic, I've even been uh, doing some projects at, at some friend's house, even, even at Dan's house. <laughs> so love, if you love want to somebody help, to help you install a water heater, he can do it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Your guy. Don't, don't put that out there publicly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's what I love to do. You know, I like to get my hands, you know, dirty. And I like to see accomplishments. I like to look back and see what, what I've done. So that's kind of 
kind of my hobby. I like to, to do things like that. Um, so I spent uh, many years in the residential construction um, line in Greenville, South Carolina, actually. Uh, was a, a general contractor there. Also had a framing contracting business and a grading business there. Um, post uh, 2008, um, I got into the insurance adjusting field and um, was in that field up until I, I moved into multifamily real estate um, and really um, adjusting, did claims management, um, looking at hurricane storm damage. Um, so that kind of add, piled on top of my construction knowledge and helped me with estimating and, and different technologies when it comes to uh, estimating properties. And uh, I live in Columbia with my wife and four daughters, um, two dogs, three hamsters and rabbit. Um, so, <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, uh, what I do for fun is uh, be a father. That's really all I have time for, uh, you know, I have work and uh, be a dad. And install so. water heaters. <laughs> install water heaters, yeah. yeah. And products around my house. But that that's it for my introduction. I'll hand it over to Dan so we can get into the ball. Sure, thing. sure. Well, I will say he also can do ice makers. So I got my wife for Mother's Day, one of these really nice, like, uh, crushed ice or soft ice makers. And he helped actually it help. He did install it. <laughs> I think my son probably helped more than I did to help you install it. So he said the problem with installing things for friends is that it comes with a lifetime warranty. <laughs> You've been over oh, there like boy. three or four times. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and one other tidbit about Danny that he didn't mention, I said, I said, I didn't kind of catch it when he was mentioning it, but he's also an author. So he has written some children's books and if you go to his website, he has some, some links there to the various children's books. You could also go to Amazon and just type his name in there and you'll see a series of, of, Amazon, of books that he's written that are available on Amazon. And it's all around kind of finance. So um, it, it's just so important. Um, one of my major passions, you know, my entrepreneur journey really got started at five years old. But, um, you know, money and finance, I think it's one of those things that should not be taboo. I know everyone here in the MFIN nation understands um, talking about money and talking about finance and how to improve your business or whatever goals you have. So um, we just need to continue to spread that message and keep people educated and informed and just know that it's okay to talk about money and finance at the dinner table. And, you know, it's a common conversation. And I think people can be, um, you know, in such a better place if we break down that barrier where it's not a weird thing or taboo or uncomfortable to talk about it. So, good. Well, let's uh, let's not uh, tear any longer. For those of you who want to dive into more information about each one of us, we also have some bio videos up at passiveinvesting.com. You can check that out. But let's let's. I want to turn it over to you, Brandon, and get us started and have you talk to us about how did how did we actually find this deal. And so um, I am in charge of acquisitions uh, for PassiveInvesting.com. So I build relationships with the brokers um, and there's multiple brokerage firms. Um, so you build those relationships on a personal level first. Um, I mean, you're touring properties, you're looking for properties, but it really comes down to uh, the brokers getting to know you. Um, so once I get to know the brokers and we get to know the brokers, we've met with them multiple times, have coffee, have lunch, um, and we start getting deals. We tell them our criteria, what, what kind of asset we're looking for. So, you know, in this case, it's a class A asset. It's a 2014 vintage. That's the year it's built. So all those fit into our criteria. The number of units, the deal size, those all fit into our criteria. Also on this particular one, this was a non-value add deal. So we didn't plan to go and renovate all of the, all of the um, units. Um, and that was our business model going into looking for a property at this point in time. This is before COVID was even an issue. And so it checked all the boxes there. Um, so the, the next step that um, in that process is I reach out to the broker um, and, you know, I believe in a very direct approach um, and, the quickest way to get to the heart of the issue is what, what's this going to sell for? What do you want to sell it for? What's the guidance? That's the word that we use. What's the guidance? And so the reason I want to know that is not necessarily that I'm going to purchase it for that, but it, it's a number we can put in our underwriting to say if it's even feasible or not, because that's what they expect to get, or that's what they want to get. Okay. Um, and so that gives us a starting point. So usually what we do is start at that point. So, build the broker relationships, look at the deal, get the deal flow, 
and start asking those questions. And then from there we go in, you know, further on down the process and, um, I can get into that a little bit now, or, or do you want to elaborate on, on that? I want to kind of know specifically about this deal itself. How did we find this particular deal? Was it through a broker relationship or was it from a seller that we kind of, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing? Yeah. So this particular deal was through a broker. Um, and we we've, were working on another deal with this particular brokerage firm and um, that deal didn't work out uh, as they often don't. It just didn't, you know, there was a better option for the seller. Um, but we had built that relationship up. And so when it came to this one, you know, it reached out instantly because the ownership of this particular property, we had purchased the property from before. So it really appealed to us as a group because we can do business, repeat business because it's a very small community. So um, this particular property, you know, as Dan mentioned, was Hawthorne Lake Norman. Hawthorne is a, is a group, um, they're a brand um, and they own multiple properties. We've purchased from them before. And so it just made sense. Um, and so that's again, how we found this particular property was broker relations and prior relationships with sellers. Um, and then, you know, we, we set up the, but even, even with the broker relationships, you know, you, you, you do all the underwriting and you go visit the property and you may have a relationship with one broker or two brokers at that firm, but you may get another broker or an assistant that you haven't dealt with before. And they're, they're constantly feeling you out when you're, when you're touring the property, they're asking you questions. They're vetting you still, even if you have a personal relationship, because they may like you, but that doesn't mean that you're able to close a deal. Okay. And so there's a difference in, in being personable and being able to execute. And so they're, they're still feeling you out in that regard and asking questions and, you know, Hey, are you able to raise this kind of money, different things like that. Um, and so that's where our, our reputation really preceded us in this particular, um, property with, you know, having purchased from the seller before and having worked with this brokerage firm before and, you know, the, our track record with closing properties. So did you, did you get a phone call from the broker? Did you get an email from the broker once you, once the deal was released or, or how, how did you get, how did, how did you actually first hear about the deal? Sure. So um, I received emails um, from all the brokerage firms, um, you know, and before COVID, you know, it was, I mean, several a day you know, I'm getting that fit kind of in our criteria loosely. I, I try to keep that broad because you can go on the brokerage sites and click your criteria and you select what vintage you're looking for. And it's a range, right? So I, I leave that range a little bit broad because there may be a one-off that's real close to what we want, but it's, it's a really good deal. So we'll go ahead and, and look at that one. Um, so I receive an email from the brokerage firm and it'll have just an initial either say coming soon and they're just trying to get you ready that you're going to have financials coming soon or it's deal OM available. Right. Um, and so when I see that email, I go instantly. My first response is to click on the email, um, go to their site, execute the confidentiality agreement, download the financials, upload them into our system. I automatic if it fits our criteria and I automatically go into CoStar who's one of our sponsors and get all the data and I actually put a link in our system that we use so that Danny and Dan can see all the data themselves and don't have to pull a paper um, report so they can just go live and kind of sort through it uh, and then I once I do that I go back to the broker in this particular case and I sent him an email and said, Hey, what's the guidance on this? Give me the price. And then we begin the underwriting process. And if the high level, just the real loose numbers make sense, then, then I'll go meet with the broker at the property and, and take the tour at that time. And what's the timeline in there? Cause you know, obviously you got the email, you got, you thought it might fit the criteria, you put it in the system, got the pricing guidance. Danny's doing something on his end to kind of do the initial kind of over, overall underwriting to see does it on a high level make sense. And then of course you're going to tour the property at that point of Danny gives you the green line and says, yes, this is a potential. So what's the timeline in there as far as how long that process actually takes? Well, from the point I received the email till it's in our system is usually 24 hours. You know, sometimes it's within 10 minutes if I'm happen to be sitting in front of my computer and I am able to look at the deal right away. Um, and then it, uh, I send out the email about Guidance was the one that I already mentioned, but also when's call for offers or CFO. Um, I want to know that because that gives me the timeline. So, I mean, is it two months out or is it, you know, 10 days out? Because sometimes we'll get deals and it's like in two weeks, you know, and we're scrambling, right? So in that case, we're speeding it up and I'll, I'll get a hold of Danny and say, hey, we got to pump this one out. 
can we get, you know, an analysis from our property managers on this, um, a pro forma from them and make sure and, and try to push it. But typically, um, I would say the timeline from looking at the deal to touring the deal um, is within a week to usually around that time frame because yeah. we have to have a discussion about it first to see if it's worth because I don't want to drive, you know, to every single property that fits our criteria if it doesn't make sense financially. So we want to have a conversation about the underwriting first and then say, yeah, all right, I'll go ahead and schedule a tour. And that's about a week to two weeks. Yeah. And it's a little bit different if you were like, if, if you had never done a deal before and you're trying to get that first deal, you're going to go and tour and get in front of those brokers all the time, whether it makes sense or not, just because you want to have that face time with the broker and build those relationships. Yeah, sure. Sure. And you know, it, it's kind of a balance, right? Because they, they don't want to waste their time either. So if you, if you're, if you've already had FaceTime with that broker, you don't want to like keep just going at properties that you're not going to buy and just throwing out LOIs that don't meet guidance. Like if they tell you, in other words, that let's just say they say guidance is, you know, high forties to 50. Right. And, and you're like, Oh, my underwriting, it'll be a good deal at, at, at 35. 40. Yeah. 35. You know, some people, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to down this method, but I'm just giving you my perspective on it. So some people will just submit, it makes sense at 35. So they'll submit an LOI at 35. You're not going to get the property. I'm just, you know, <laughs> it's just not going to happen because they've already done a BOV. That's broker's opinion of value on the property. And they have, they have a range of their commission. So, you know, they're, if they sell it for, for what they said, the low end, they get their commission. And then it goes like this for anything over top of that, that they get. So, you know, they're wanting to push it. And if you're coming in over here, <laughs> the seller, number one's not going to sell it and the broker's not going to get their commission. And it's just not going to make sense. So you're kind of like waste, I won't say wasting, but spinning wheels or not getting traction, if that's a better way to put it. Um, so it's a different mentality. And again, I don't want to down anybody's method, but that's just my, that's my method. That's well, and the different property types, you know, if it's like a mom and pop and it's like a 30 unit where sure. maybe they haven't seen an offer in a year, but they've had it listed for three years, throw something in and see if it works. But, you know, for institutional quality assets that we look at that are greater than a $30 million purchase price, you have professional sellers they've done deals before you have professional brokers they've done deals before most buyers have done deals before um so it, it it's a little bit more organized than your 50 unit mom and pop owner mm -hmm. um who the kids are going to inherit it but they don't want it anymore and they just want to sell it and and go on vacation well you bring up a good point too about the nuances of deals and there's also I, I do want to mention this there's nuances of brokers of brokerage firms i can say and they they run the gamut and it's not that any one way is right or wrong it's just you have to know the nuance of the firm you're working with so some are more formal and more just you know box checking and some are more casual and more personal and some are more scatterbrained you know or some are kind of <laughs> set up on a franchise type setup and some are some are on a complete, they all get commissioned for every deal. And some, you know, it's only the, if you were the, the deals broker they the sell deal. or work on. Yeah. Right. And some they're just under the heading of a company and they, but they really run their own shop and they're just using the infrastructure of the company. So you have to learn how they function and then act accordingly. Um, so, you know, I'm not a suit and tie kind of guy, you know, that's not, that's not my game, especially if I'm going to be touring a property, I'm not going to show up in dress shoes because you know, I'm going to be walking the grounds and, you know, maybe get, dirty, but there's some firms that are, are that way, you know, suit and tie, everything. And there's some that, that show up in a polo shirt and jeans, you know, it's, it's okay. You just have to know who you're dealing with. Like we do. <laughs> <laughs> it usually surprises some of the people when we show up like that, but they're used <laughs> to the institutional people coming in in suits and ties. And, you know, they're not usually, they're usually the people that are working for the other people. So, well, and, and that's, you know, that's a, a marketing ploy that we use if you're working with a formal broker that maybe hasn't worked with you before, you know, um, you know, sometimes, and this, I don't want to sound wrong, but like we'll in, utilize a driver sometimes, right. To, because we're trying to get work done. It's not that, you know, we're trying to be bougie or anything. It's just that, you know, we're trying to get work done and it, it I don't want to be behind a windshield staring out the window for four hours driving up the road. Sometimes my driver is Brandon. Sometimes <laughs> he has to get the work done. So, but, 
what I'm saying is if it's a formal broker that I'm trying to, let's say impress or like that, I, I make note of that, you know, I'll just mention, Oh yeah, my driver. Okay. And it, that may sound weird, but that's, that's a, that's a, something I've used. So. And, and even, you know, pulling it back to this specific deal, Brandon had mentioned, we worked with the broker on a deal kind of six months before this one that we lost out on. It was the same group. Brandon had met the broker before and knew that they were formal. And mm -hmm. so I actually dressed up for the first time. I wore a sport coat to the property <laughs> and made it a point to kind of dress the part of, you know, being a professional kind of corporate-y type of role. And I walked around as I always do. I always have a notebook and a pen with me just to write things down. But, you know, I made it a point to be very formal in that interaction. And, you know, whether that helped us or not, we didn't win the deal we were looking at. But I think it helped build that relationship to just kind of say, wow, this is a high quality group. You know, we would love to work with you at some point. And, and it just worked out on the, the following one that we worked with them on. So small nuances, but, you know, pay attention to those details. All right. So we got the email. We underwrote it initially. It's a green light. Brandon goes out. He's touring the, touring the property now with the broker. It's now come back. He's given Danny some additional information from the on-site, you know, kind of due diligence piece from, a, from, a, from the touring perspective. Danny's now finalizing the underwriting and getting it a little bit closer to where we want it to be. Now we're into the session, the, session, the, the, the call for offers of section, right? So we were now submitting an offer. How many rounds of offers, Brandon, did we actually go through on this particular acquisition? This one was uh, three, three rounds. And that's pretty typical, um, what we find. And, and never believe and I can say this with, with a straight face, never believe a broker when he says there won't be a best and best the final, or, a, you know, another best and final after the best and final. It, in my experience, there's always a third round, right? There's initial and that kind of weeds out the tire kickers, right? And then you have the group that they think they want to sell to. And then they narrow that down to two or three groups. And then, you know, and then they select off of that. And usually at that point, uh, the two or three groups you're having with the, you know, buyer interview calls. And so they'll send you a questionnaire and you have to fill out, you know, where are you in the right and cap rate? Where's your, um, what's your insurance quote? You know, what's your sensitivity on the interest rate? You know, how much are you underwriting for expansion? I don't want to steal Danny's thunder. This is his, this is his, uh, you know, bucket of expertise. So, but that's what, what's on the questionnaire and then they have a call with the owners and the brokers and us as buyers. And they're just asking you questions and you just answer those questions. Um, so. And it's always nice to have a buyer call with a seller that you've already bought a deal with because there's oh, yeah. a lot of introduction stuff that you don't have to do that you normally would with somebody who hasn't, uh, hasn't done a, who you haven't done a deal with yet. I would say it's, it's like, you can't even put a, a price on that. Like it's just yeah. the familiarity out with the person talking, you know, like, Hey, so-and-so, how are you? Oh, good. Yeah. How have you been? You know, and it's like, it just kind of makes it a little more personal and a less, you know, business. Um, but as long as that last transaction was about, good, right? <laughs> what's that? As long as that last transaction was a good transaction. Yeah. And that's, that's our MO. We want every transaction to be like seamless for the seller so that we can buy from them again. I mean, that's, we do that intentionally. Um, but I will say too, to get in the best and final, this is an important piece. You know, again, I, I believe in a straightforward methodology. I just ask the broker, where's the best final cutoff? Where do I need to be at to make it in the, that, that second bucket, you know, and, and that's where, you know, if, if I can bid that, then that's where I'm going to be. And I'm going to be at the low end of that because I want room for expansion in that third round or, you know, or best and final or third round or whatever. Um, but that's kind of where it just, what's the guidance? How much do you want for it? Okay. Where's best and final. And it's going to move from initial guidance, best and final cutoff is going to go up and then it's going to go up from there. <laughs> it's just, it's just the way it goes. That doesn't mean you have to go up. I'm just saying that's where they're going to try to push you. Cause again, they've got that hockey stick commission, right. And they're trying to get that, that number up because they're trying to make a living too and put food on their table. 
And so they're trying to sell it for as much as they can. Just remember, they are trying to sell it for as much as they can. And as friendly as they are with you and as well as you know them, they're trying to make money. They're selling you something. Okay. So remember the relationship. <laughs> so. So Danny, let's talk a little bit about the final offer that was accepted with the seller on this particular acquisition. And then let's move into some of the earnest money discussion as well. Like what kind of earnest money was, did we have to put up for this particular project? And then obviously we can talk about some things that changed later on in the deal that allowed us to be able to get an even better purchase price, uh, which would be a retrade. But talk to us first about what was that initial offer that, or that final offer that got initially accepted? The, the final offer that got initially accepted, and again, before we make this final offer, we have a call on with our partners, the three of us, to review final assumptions, right? Not everything is a fixed, um, a fixed item. I don't want to use the word variable, but a fixed thing where you can set it and it's guaranteed, right? Interest rates move. Um, insurance costs change, right? If a name storm came through in- in, in My chair um, just fell down. <laughs> yeah, I'm just watching Dan go lower and lower. No, over here. <laughs> um, Sorry about so, that. So if there was a catastrophic insurance event, rates could triple. And so we make a, an educated decision on what our final assumptions are for these things and utilize our experience, the knowledge of our property manager to confirm our costs and where we're at, utilize our attorneys for any sort of closing expenses, bring all the professionals into it. Our, um, our debt broker or the person who's helping get us a loan to finalize some of those interest rates. And we make that final decision. I think this one, you know, is right around 51 million where we submitted that final offer at. And typically, you know, with these institutional size deals, um, we are, are doing a 2% kind of earnest hard money deposit. This is all kind of pre-COVID. Um, typically for these deals, 2%. So you're talking about a million, a million dollars of hard money. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's maybe two to 3% or even 4%. It really just depends. Again, maybe you're a newer group. And so the seller may say, hey, we'll take a chance on you, but you need to have for a $50 million deal, you need to put up 3 million hard money. If you can't close the deal, we're keeping your $3 million. So if you're a more experienced group and you've done business before, maybe it's on that lower end of like the million bucks, but somewhere in that range. So it is a, um, it's a significant conversation. It's a huge dollar amount that we as the managing partners commit our personal funds to go and do this. And so if we ever walked away from a deal or didn't close, it's not at risk capital from any investors. It's our personal managing partner dollars that are at risk. And so we, we take very seriously those final, final assumptions that we make to make that offer. And, you know, as we all are humans in the world today, things change. And that's one thing we encountered with this deal specifically um, where COVID broke and it all of a sudden became a, a federal pandemic, a national state of emergency across pretty much every state in the country, as well as other countries around the nations. And, and that really caused a global worry in the financial markets, right? We saw the stock market tank. We saw the treasury rates um, being very volatile, the bond market extremely volatile. We saw um, a lot of lenders and businesses pause what they were doing and say, we're not doing any more loans until we figure out the effects of COVID-19 and what's gonna happen in the world Later this day, later today, um, I was famous for saying things are changing just hour by hour, and eventually things got better and stabilized. But there was a ripple effect still 
in effect today within the multifamily industry where a lot of CMBS lenders, life insurance company lenders, bridge and private lenders have just still stopped their business. They're not doing any more loans. And so what that creates at a really, really high level, I'm not going to go into the, the minutia detail, but it just creates a supply and demand effect. So today, interest rates are still favorable. Um, so there's a high volume of people who want to refi to get into a lower cost of debt, a lower interest rate. And the supply of lenders has decreased. So you got this big volume of demand, this low volume of supply. And so it created kind of this perfect storm throughout COVID where interest rates rose dramatically um, to the tune of like 25 to 40% increases on quotes. So I use that percentage because if a rate went from 3% to 4%, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a 33% increase um, in your rate. And so if you were going to buy you know, a gallon of milk and pay 33% more tomorrow than you bought it for today, that's a huge impact. And, you know, we're talking about debt to the tune of $35, $40 million. And so that 33% increase in cost is huge um, to the deal. And so that's something that we had to work through. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, the seller is professional. The broker helping execute the transaction is a professional. And we're a professional. And so, you know, Brandon mentioned this, that we, you know, if there's an issue, we're going to come forward with it. We're not going to wait until the 12th hour or the day before closing and just say, hey, we can't do this. We need to change it. And so we came forward, I mean, immediately upon learning that there was a federal pandemic announced. There were shelter in places all around the country. No lenders were doing business except for agencies. Pricing has gone up 30 some percent. Um, in the debt market. And so we kind of just said, hey, here's what we're dealing with. How can we all work together to get this done? And so that's what Dan was alluding to. You know, the seller was was able to help us and work with us in a price concession because our interest rate went up. And so it, it was really just a question of either time or money. So if if you want to close quickly, we need to reduce the amount of money. If we could wait until COVID was over, right, give us some time, maybe everything goes back to normal. I talked about our assumptions that we review, right? We made an assumption on what the interest rate would be, and five days later, rates went way up. N no control that I had over it, or our group, or the seller or the broker or the debt person had over it. And so it's one of those moments, um, I call them challenges that you're all going to be faced with as you go throughout your business. And, you know, every challenge that we face as multifamily investors have been encountered by other people. And so one of the first things we did is we called our mentor and said, Hey, how have you dealt with this? because you've bought three times the amount of properties that we have and we just need help. We need guidance. Here's what we think we should do. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you give us some other option to think about? And that is really important. Um, I still have those moments where I get that knot in my stomach or I get the, the nerves of this is a huge issue. And then I bring it up to Dan and Brandon and we think through it and we can solve it. Everything is figure outable. And so that was one of those moments where we're like, oh, shoot, we've got a problem. We've got a bunch of money on the line. How do we solve this? And again, be transparent, be upfront, be honest, do it quickly. Um, don't wait until the last minute. And just remember that everyone involved is a professional and you're going to get things done. And so that's... Um, that's the big thing that I would say about that whole process of going from final offer to PSA to 
getting into due diligence and getting ready to close the deal. That's kind of what transpired from a financial side of things and financial due diligence aspect. Well, and I think one of the things we got to talk about too is, is, you know, I, I remember all three of us getting on a call when all this happened and, you know, we're, we're putting more risk money when they wanted when we asked to retrade on the price, they, they basically said, yes, we're willing to do it, but here's what you're going to have to be able to get, you had to put up even more risk money. And so we had to sit down and have that conversation. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's what I like to call a butt pucker moment. You know what I mean? I mean, it's one of those not situations. Of heart. It's definitely not for the faint of yeah. heart, but, but you know, if it was very easy and mellow and just floating down the river, then, you know, it's, it's not, you're not advancing or, or moving forward. So, I mean, resistance and, and, you know, learning, we learned so much from going through that, uh, that, you know, we're stronger, better team on the other side, you know, and that, that other, having that personal relationship with the seller helped us, I think, quite a bit um, in that retrade because we've never prior to that, we've never gone for retrade. That's one of our MOs is like, don't retrade underwrite with enough expansion. So you don't have to retrade except for COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I mean, who well, knows? and Danny talk to us a little bit about like, why do you think they actually retraded with us? Because according to the contract, they really didn't have to, they could have just said, Nope, we're going to stick it to you. You know, you got to do it at that purchase price. And you know, we would either have had to like pass on the deal and you know, even lose that risk money that we had up front or, you know, moving forward and, and just accepting the higher price in the, in the current environment. So why do you think that they even really wanted to have that conversation with us and were amenable to it? Well, you know, the first part is, again, just being a professional, um, you're going to have that conversation. I can always listen and say no, or say that doesn't work, but here's um, something else. And, you know, I think that's part of it. We've built a good relationship. We've, you know, we're truthful. We're honest with all of these people throughout our transaction. And so, like Brandon had mentioned earlier, and you probably hear me say that one more time today, but... Um, it's a small industry when you talk about buying $30 million plus multifamily assets. And so part of the reason why I think the seller would agree to it is, again, it's the time factor. You know, are they going to get a new buyer in at that time with COVID breaking and state of shelter in places across every country, every nation was shut down? Um, no, I don't think they would have been able to get a new buyer in quickly. And so for them, it's just a question of, do we proceed with selling, right? And we have some known outcomes from that and we can adjust our profit accordingly, or do I move to the other side and say, hey, we're not willing to do this. It's how much more time is it gonna take me? And how many more unknowns am I going to encounter? Could COVID have decimated millions and hundreds of millions of people, um, they may not be in a position to sell for the next 20 years, right? If the worst case scenarios. And so I think they literally just kind of weighed the risk versus the reward and made an educated decision. And, and I, and it worked out for everyone involved. You know, we, we know that it was a, a good um, transaction. I think everybody had a positive outcome from it. And for them, I think it was just a matter of getting the proceeds um, and moving on to their next project. They did not want to be um, involved from a time capacity in that project anymore. And so it was time to move on. Well, and another factor that you have to think about is that some groups MO is to go ahead and, and sign a PSA for what the seller wants for the property and then intending to retrade. Okay. So, you know, I'll use the word, Danny knows this word. He's going to smile when I say it recreational. Right. <laughs> and so if, if you're, you know, they knew that we weren't just doing this. I mean, they were. Well, that's where the whole relationship piece comes in. Right. And how Check fast our references. Them. Do right. we do this routinely? No. So. I mean, this yeah, was the we first time we had ever actually done it. I mean, we had never really never retraded ever. And the well, day we found out, we, we, we and, let them know there's going to be something it, going on. 
it, it also helps when you're, again, you're dealing with professionals, right? They are looking at new acquisitions as well. And so when they get on the phone and they say, oh gosh, these agency lenders are really beating us up too. We know, you know, you're not, you're not making a story up about higher interest rates because we just called Fannie or Freddie and they quoted us almost 4% on a new deal. And so, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, and again, people want to work with people. There was one question in there um, from Mike Brennan regarding the underwriting and kind of the, the non-fixed items. Yes, Mike, we have wiggle room in there. You need to have some sort of cushion, um, whether it's within each line item or overall on the deal. But what I like to say and how I think about it is we have levers to pull if something changes. And so if interest rates go way up, I could pull a lever over here to make a reduction to counteract that increase. And, and we always like to have multiple levers that we can change to ensure that we're conservative when we're underwriting and making those assumptions. I only have about 10 minutes left in the episode today. So I'm going to make sure we get to a couple of other items here. Um, just to quickly go through it, you know, due diligence went really well, didn't really have a lot of hiccups. If we have time at the end, we can maybe talk about one little thing that happened, but it was really kind of minor. Um, doesn't really, it doesn't really, didn't really change anything for us. Um, but then as far as the Financing, yes, the financing changed. We actually ended up doing a permanent agency, uh, Fannie, uh, Freddie Mac actually on this one, uh, Freddie Mac uh, loan and got a very favorable interest rate, even lower than what we were originally quoted when we, re when we, when we retraded because the, the, the debt market kind of shifted and changed and uh, Danny was able to kind of go beat up the lender a little bit more to try to get a little better rate. Wish we would have gotten an even better one, but I feel like we did a, he did a stellar job in, in getting the rate that we did on that. We did the best we could. Yeah. given all of the the circumstances outside of of our control really and you know yeah yeah so let, let's let's kind of dive into the investor's side of it because i know somebody you know we're actually recording this for those of you who are watch, listening to this on the podcast we're recording this as a live podcast and so we have some people on here that are asking some questions about we had somebody ask about uh you know are you using institutional money to acquire these kind of assets or are you using you know uh, a syndication model and we're doing it via syndication so the, the purpose of our PassiveInvesting.com team and group is to acquire assets and allow everyday investors like yourself that you know, want to invest in these, these institutional quality assets to have an opportunity to do that. And so we actually turn down a lot of, uh, of, of institutional equity people that want to write really large checks. And we say, no, we, wanna, we, we, like, we like to be able to bring in uh, smaller checks and, and bring this in. And so to talk to you a little bit about how we structured it, um, First off, you know, to give you an idea as to the, the, when we say we raised $20 million, it wasn't just with like five investors. It was with just over 250 investors in this property. So we have quite a large number of investors in here and, you know, average investment was close to around like, you know, like seventy five, eighty thousand dollars um, when you, when you average it all out. So it was a, it was a process of, of getting, you know, all the equity in at the same time to be able to get it closed on time. So we, you know, had a lot of challenges with COVID-19 and our last deal that we raised was a $51.5 million acquisition out of, out of Raleigh, North Carolina. And we actually did an episode on that one uh, a couple of months ago. And so you can go and research that one. It was actually a 272 unit or 270 unit uh, property out of Raleigh called the Carrington at Briar Creek. And that one actually, we raised $14 million and it, we did that in just under two weeks. And so, of course, with this one going from 14 million to you know almost 20 million, we were thinking, yeah, it should be it shouldn't be that hard. We actually on our website had already had over six to seven hundred new investors that had reached out to us and were interested in our property. I mean, in our in our next acquisition or next property, so we thought it was going to be a walk in the park. And then, of course, the pandemic hit, and uh, you know, it, it, it caused us to have a lot of challenges when it came to to raising the equity. And we literally raised the final amount the day before closing, right? And uh, we got that final amount the day before closing and we were able to close it and get it across the finish line uh, on time. We didn't have to execute an extension or anything like that. And, and it was because of our investors that we have in our, in our, in our database that pulled it pulled together and, and, and really kind of, you know, helped us get through this. Now, 
that process of, of getting the investors and having them understand it, it was a long process. So it was, it was, it was the most work I have ever done on an acquisition to be able to raise equity for a deal. And I, I we've, we did more webinars about the deal, more updates, more emails than any other deal we had done in the past. And a lot of it was just informational stuff to, and it wasn't just like, we didn't just send the same email out over like multiple times. It was always an update on, on the status of the acquisition. So as things changed and as we got data in, we were presenting and sharing that with the investors talking about the, the status of the, the April collections and the status of the May collections and all of that the investors were very concerned about because they were wondering. And then I'll let you talk a little bit, Brandon, about what we did from, a, from the lease perspective because we also did a lease audit that allowed us to get some demographic information, which was very helpful for us to be able to show to the investors as well. As well. Yeah, so um, we wanted to find out with that demographic study, and this is something we did on all of our properties, but especially this one, when we want to instill investor confidence, um, is find out what's the income level of the people at the property. Are they you know, needing assistance? Are they filing for rent deferment, um, you know, set up on payment plans? What's going on? You know, what, what's happening at the property? So um, we worked with, our, our asset manager worked with the um, own, current owners, you know, so it's under contract and, and they provided that study for us. Um, and it really just gave an income range. And it was in, for this particular property, it was in the mid eighties, 84,000, I think was the average income mm -hmm. across the property. And the average rents were right in the mid 1300s. Um, I think those are, I'm just yep. that out and but that's a really great place to be because you want your average income, you want your income of your tenant to be at least three times what the rent is going to be. Right. So obviously that's much greater than that. And, um, we also did, um, a collection study or had a collection report provided, um, for both April and May, um, to see what collections, what was happening at the property because you know, we always are, you're always fearful of even if people have the money to pay that they're going to take advantage of a situation and just not do it. I mean, that happens, right? It's not the norm, but it does happen. There are people that take advantage of, of bad situations um, for their benefit. But with this one, um, you know, I think initial, our initial April report was 94% on the rate right on the 5th. Um, but I think it's like a, for, a fifth through seventh range is usually when they get rent. And I think by the seventh, we were at uh, 98 plus on our first April report. And then in May is, is much in the same range. So on the fifth, I think we were 96.7%. And then on the seventh, we were much better than that. So, you know, that was a big piece of the confidence level for our investors is understanding, look, you know, and we, again, we, we chose this property before COVID was even a word that was coming out of my mouth, you know, like it wasn't even in my vocabulary yet. And it worked out perfectly because it was not a value add, right? And we weren't gonna infuse a lot of capital, try to increase and push rents, right? So we're gonna keep rents the same. And so that works out perfectly for this. And it was a cash flowing asset, had good cash flow. Uh, the break even occupancy was, and Danny will have to correct me, but I don't, um, it was about 54% was a break even occupancy on that. 55%. So 55%. We, yeah. could, we could lose 55% of the residents and still pay all of our bills and debt service. But that was r running the property at full capacity. So if you're down by 55%, your costs are going to come down, not by 55%, but you know, you might not need, you know, two leasing agents on there and you may not need all of the maintenance staff. So your cost is going to decrease, but at 55% occupancy, we could still pay everything at hundred percent budget and debt service. So that was another piece of the puzzle that made this just be the right deal for right now. We're not pushing rents. 9% was our projected increase for year one. Um, you know, we, we had expanded that to 18 months stabilization, even on the 9% increase, which is nothing. Um, that's market rent that, you know, they, they just weren't achieving market. So we instituted the daily pricing to get it up by 9%, no value add, and our demographic study, nobody was applying for assistance and our average income was very high. The other part of the demographic study was what sector um, of the workforce 
were our tenants involved in? So were they corporate, you know, were they consultants, you know, what, what area were they service workers? You know, did they work at a restaurant and uh, were they, you know, or they, did they deal with travel or vacation um, in those industries? And if they were, you know, those are the most, were the most at risk of the people that suffered or were affected the most through COVID, you know, restaurants shut down and, and different things like that, retail, different things like that. So that showed us that the property was very sound from that perspective because we had very few, I think it was, I want to say it was less than 1% that were in the service industry um, on yep. the demographic study. Yeah. Um, so Great. Well, and we're, I, I know we could, we could probably sit here and talk about this property for the next couple of hours because we've done so, we've spent so much of our life over the last, you know, 60 days dealing, and actually really 90 to 120 days dealing with this property. And it's going to be a great, it is going to be a great investment for us and for our investors. And, uh, you know, we, we ended up doing a two tiered structure with this one for the investors. We had a preferred equity piece of a class A of about 35% of the capital stack. And that provided a, a particular return that allowed the investors to have higher cash flows during the whole period, but no participation in the upside or when we sell the property or have a capital event. And then we had a class B structure, which was your typical common equity piece and slice that uh, was a, a lower preferred return, but then also provided them the opportunity to participate with the upside. So it just depended on, we gave the investors kind of three options. They could either have a, a cash flow driven model with the preferred equity piece, or they could have a, a, a growth model with the class B investments, or they could do a blended approach where they wanted to kind of put half of their investment in B, I mean, A, and then half of it in B, you know, they can do 75, 25, whatever they felt was best for them. We able to, we were able to give them some options. And I think that was another one of the reasons why we were able to get it over the edge and, uh, and get these investors to jump in. I had one person here that was watching us live uh, was asking us about, did you have any investors, you know, that kind of, you know, backed out if it, and then didn't stay committed to it because of the pandemic. And we actually looked back at the numbers. We only had about five or six people that originally committed that backed out. But then we had probably another three or four of those actually come back in after they saw some of the data coming back in off the property as well and how solid of a, how solid of a project it was. And, uh, and obviously this was a, a seven year hold. So it was a little bit longer than what we have done in the past. Normally do we do a five year hold, but this was, this was our first class A that we acquired. So this will be the first of many that we'll be acquiring in this asset class. And, uh, and so it was definitely a, a struggle and a challenge to raise the capital, but we did it. And uh, we have some really, ex really solid investors that came through for us and some great partners. And uh, I know we're coming up against the clock here. Danny actually already left. So I think he probably had a tea time or something like that to get to because he probably, I think he usually plays golf on, on Thursday afternoon. Starbucks order was ready. Starbucks, yeah. It's either Starbucks or he had to go, go walk George or he had a, a tea time. But uh, he, he dropped off a little bit early uh, to, to, with, with another arrangement that he had. But uh, I thank Danny for jumping on with us. Thank you as well, Brandon, for, for joining us here and, and helping us out with uh, sharing with our audience. and. Uh, looking forward to closing the next deal and uh, and doing this again. I think this is actually a great format to be able to do a, a live MFIN podcast recording. This was the first time we did it and uh, looking forward to uh, doing another one. Yeah. Hope everybody enjoyed the content. We enjoy it. We enjoy talking about it. Obviously we, we do it a lot. <laughs> Brian <laughs> but, likes uh, talking more than anybody. Can you tell? I don't know about that. I think Dan talks more than me. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Ask our wives. They both say we talk too much. <laughs> and Danny's not here to talk to talk at all. So I guess, uh, I guess it's just between the two of us. So, well, uh, well, thank you for those, for those of you who are watching us uh, live. And also thank you for those of you who are watching the recording as well as on the podcast. Um, if you're interested in uh, us in, in being on the podcast and you have closed a deal in the last 12 months, uh, shoot us an email. Uh, you can shoot an email over to Stacy S T A S T A C E Y at multifamilyinvestornation.com. Love to have you on the podcast and get you on here and maybe we'll do it live as well and record it for everybody else to be able to find some benefits. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on the MFI and podcast as well as our weekly webinars.